Well, welcome to a series of recordings of Journey into Complex Analysis. This is designed for those who have already done <coughs> a first course in complex arithmetic. We will be starting from scratch but moving fairly quickly through and at a slightly more advanced level. So we begin with just looking at some complex functions and complex numbers and some basic facts. So recall that the we have this thing called the Argand diagram, which is simply like the xy plane, except we have a real and imaginary axis. We represent a complex number z by uh, using its coordinates xy, where z is x plus iy. And x we call the real part of z, and y is the imaginary part of z. So we can take a complex number and represent it in the plane thus. Now, we can also represent a complex number in polar form by measuring the distance from the origin the complex number makes. So this is the complex number z here. And measuring the angle it makes with the positive real axis. And in doing so, it's very simple then that one can um, put this complex number into polar form and write it as... Uh, the x, of course, is just our cos theta and the y is our sine theta, so we can write this in the form z is r cos theta plus i sine theta. And then we define cos theta plus i sine theta to be e to the i theta, that is a definition, uh, where the r is the so-called modulus, which is written as mod z, absolute value of z, which is just Pythagoras gives you a square root of x squared plus y squared. And theta belongs to, well, argz is actually a set of values because we can, we can add 2 pi to this angle here and we get a small argz. This is a set of arguments. The principal one, uh, sorry, well, firstly, the latter in equality, this formula here, is referred to as Euler's formula, and as I said, is a definition. For definiteness, we, definiteness, we choose the principal value of argz to be theta, where we insist that this theta be between minus pi, uh, not including minus pi, up to plus pi, and this is the principal value, or PV of argz, and often written as capital arg of z. So, sim simple exercise to write a complex number in polar form. So we take the modulus of the complex number. So we take minus 3 squared plus 3 squared, which gives me 18. Take the square roots 3 root 2. And if you plot this complex number, it's minus 3 plus 3i. And you can immediately see that its principal argument is 3 pi on 4. And so there's the polar form for this complex number. And this is what I'm going to refer to as the polar form. The form with the cos theta plus i sine theta is this. I tend to think of this as a kind of intermediary form between the Cartesian and the proper polar form. Now, addition of complex numbers corresponds to uh, vector addition. And, of course, you'll recall the triangle inequality which is very important. This is the first triangle inequality. Um, there is a second triangle inequality, which is probably worth mentioning here, which is mod z1 minus um, mod z2, or plus or minus. And the this also is plus or minus. And I can say this is bigger than the absolute value of mod z1 minus mod z2. So there's another triangle inequality, the so-called second triangle inequality, that we will be using from time to time. That should be fairly uh, in terms of revision for you, because this should be stuff that you've seen before. For multiplication of complex numbers, we simply multiply them using the fact that i squared is minus 1. And we can multiply complex numbers out and arrive at their product, which of course is also a complex number. We'll come back to that one in a minute, and also note that the modulus of the product is the product of the moduli. 
And that's a nice little fact because it enables us to do some interesting little calculations that are connected really with number theory. We can write each of the numbers, so the example here is to write each of the numbers 20 and 29 as the sum of two squares, and hence write their product as the sum of two squares. So I can write 20 as the square of the modulus of 4 plus 2i, because that's 16 plus 4 is 20, and 29 is 5 squared plus 2 squared, and so that's the square of the modulus of 5 plus 2i. Now, of course, it's also the same as the square of the modulus of 2 plus 4i or 2 plus 5i for 29. So if I multiply the two complex numbers together, then using this fact up here, I can just, that gives me 580, I can multiply the two complex numbers first and then take the square of the modulus. And when you multiply this, these complex numbers out, you simply get 16 plus 18i modulus squared, which gives you 16 squared plus 18 squared. So I've now written 580 as the sum of two squares. Alternatively, I could have, what did I do here? I kept the 4 plus 2i, and I wrote this as 2 plus 5i. And so I did put that there, and when you multiply these out, I get a different complex number. I get minus 2 plus 24i, and that's 2 squared plus 24 squared. And that, again, gives me another way of writing 580 as the sum of two squares. And you might like to experiment to see if there are other ways of writing this number as the sum of two squares. You should remember de Moivre's theorem, which simply says that it's basically the index laws for complex numbers. So if you multiply r1 e to, r e to the i theta 1 by r2 e to the i theta 2, then you multiply the moduli and you add the arguments. And that, that's equivalent to this statement here, that cos theta plus i sine theta is cos n theta plus i sine n theta. This is de Moivre's um, formula, de Moivre's theorem, and you should check that you can that these are in fact um, equivalent to each other. Just as a nice little example here, a uh, slightly harder one here, we take theta uh, to be real and not a multiple of two pi, lest we divide by zero, and we're going to take n to be a positive um, non-zero integer, and z is e to the i theta. And in the example, we're asked to show that 1 minus z to the n on 1 minus z is given, simplifies to this expression here. And then we're going to deduce that the modulus of sine n theta on 2, or the absolute value now, of sine n theta on 2 on the sine of theta on 2 is the modulus of this, that's easy. And then we're going to deduce that under the above conditions, we can get a bound on the absolute value of sine n theta on 2 on sine theta on 2. Nice little exercise here. So essentially, we start off with the um, what we had on the left-hand side, 1 minus z to the n on 1 minus z. And I'm replacing z with e to the i theta. So I just plug that straight in. Now we do a little trick here. In, in algebra, in fact in mathematics generally, we love symmetries. And so at the moment these are sort of asymmetric. So I try and get some symmetry into it. Look at the bottom firstly. I'm going to factor out e to the i theta on 2. And I take out a minus sign just to get things around the right way. And that means I can, I can rewrite 1 minus e to the i theta as e to the i theta on 2 minus e to the minus i theta on 2 multiplied by this minus e to the i theta on 2. We do that because it gives me some nice symmetry here and also because there's a nice formula for this. Uh, and I do the same on the top, so I'm going to factor out minus e to the i n theta on 2, which gives me again a nice symmetric formula here. Now, uh, this minus this is 2i times sine theta on 2. So there's actually a 2i down here. But then similarly on the top, this thing here gives me 2i sine n theta on 2. And so I've cancelled out the 2i's top and bottom here. And I've cancelled out the minus signs. So that's the first part of the 
little exercise we were asked to do. And we get the second part easily by just taking the moduli. So if we take the modulus of both sides, then the modulus of e to the i n theta on 2 is 1, and the modulus of e to the i theta on 2 is 1, so that gets rid of those. And that's the second part of the problem we were asked to show. Now the third part is interesting because this, this uh, 1 minus z to the n divided by 1 minus z, I can factorise this as 1 minus z times 1 plus z plus z squared up to z to the n minus 1, and that 1 minus z term on the top will cancel with the one on the bottom. And of course, that's why we needed theta not to be a multiple of 2 pi, so we don't end up in with uh, 0 on the bottom. And I can hit this with the triangle inequality, uh, extend the triangle inequality, and say, look, that's less or equal to 1 plus the modulus of z plus the modulus of z squared, which is the same as the modulus of z all squared, plus up to here. And then... The modulus of each of these numbers, z is e to the i theta, so the moduli are all 1, and so I just get 1 plus 1 plus 1 n times, and that gives me n. And that gives me an interesting bound on the, abs on the uh, absolute value of sine n theta on 2 on sine theta on 2. Just as a nice little exercise there. Well, I put some little challenge problems in you might like to have a go at uh, along the way. So here's the first one here, that if omega is a cube root of unity, that is, it's e to the i 2 theta on 3, then when you multiply out x plus y plus z times x plus y omega plus z omega squared plus x plus y omega squared plus z omega, you get this interesting expression, you get a sum of the cubes of these x, y's and z's minus 3 times the product. So uh, basically what we're doing here is we're taking this expression and we're factorising this over the complex numbers. And then having done that, you can then use that to solve this cubic. Try seeing what you can do to see how you would solve this particular cubic here using this identity above here to solve this over the complex numbers. Now I want to say a bit more about complex functions. We'll say a lot more about complex functions, but just at the moment then we, we take d as a subset of the complex numbers and we have a function f maps this region d into the complex numbers. This denotes a complex valued function of the complex variable z. If you substitute z equals x plus i y into your function, then you can write the f, you can split this up into something which is called the real part. That is, it's going to have lots of x's and y's, but no i's in it. You get the real part, plus i times some other function of x and y, which we call v, the imaginary part. So the u and v are called the real and imaginary parts of f. So note that u and v are real valued functions of two variables, x and y. And I've just done a simple example there. So here's a nice cubic. We get z cubed minus 2z plus 7. I replace z with x plus i, y. So I plug it in. I've got a cubit minus twice x plus i, y plus 7. And then I just took a deep breath and expanded it all out. And we get an x cubed minus 3xy squared minus 2x plus 7. That's the real part. And plus i times 3x squared y minus y cubed minus 2y. And that's the imaginary part. And that's my u and my v. Now we'll see shortly that, of course, these u's and v's ha happen in this case because this is a very nice function. These u's and v's happen to be intimately connected with each other. So much so that even if I just give you the u and I rub out the v, uh, given that these come from what we're going to call an analytic function, you can reconstruct the v just knowing the u. That is how closely connected these are. Well, at least up to a constant. A little bit of topological language, um, more terminology than anything else. So we talk about the open disk 
around Z0 in the complex numbers of radius R is this set. It's a set of all complex numbers Z whose distance from Z0 is less than capital R. A subset D is said to be open if for every D, every Z inside this set D, there is some open disk around Z also contained in D. Another way of thinking about this, uh, I like to use a slightly more graphic language. So here's an example of this setting here. This is an example of what we're going to call an open set. In less fancy language, it means that if you pick any point inside here, then there's enough room to swing a cat. That is, you can just squeeze a little open disk, a little open uh, set around that, a little open disk around that point, and it stays inside the region D. So this would be our region D, it's the interior here. Now remember the boundary is not included here, so you can go as close as you like to the boundary and there's still enough room to swing a cat as long as the cat's small enough. So this is an example of an open set. On the other hand, if I include the boundary, then if I pick a point Z that is now on the boundary, you can see there's not enough room to swing a cat because as soon as you put an epsilon neighborhood there, part of it's going to go outside of D, and so this set would not be open. So in rough terms, a set is open if at every point Z in the set there's enough room to swing a cat, or more formally, there is some open disk around Z also contained in D. The Subset D is said to be a closed set if its complement, uh, if its complement D bar is an open set. A set is said to be connected. Important point: if for any two points Z and W inside the set, there is a continuous path from Z to W lying entirely inside D. And a subset D, which is of the complex numbers, which is both open and connected, is called a domain. So these are just some terminologies we're going to use. So connected means you can get from any point to any other point along some continuous path that lies entirely inside the set. And open and connected means it's a domain. So, for example, uh, the disk D, which consists of the open disk um, of radius 1, all the points inside here, we've seen that this is an open set. At every point inside here, there's enough room to swing a cat. And if you pick any two points in here, you can move from one to the other, staying inside the set. So that is a domain. Here's another example of a domain. The sector mod Z, sorry, Z, whose argument lies between pi on 3 and 2 pi on 3. So that's this wedge shape here. And again, at every point in the set, there's enough room to swing a cat. And you can move from any other point, from any point to any other point. Notice we exclude 0 because the argument of 0 is not defined. We will shortly uh, see that in some instances it is useful to add what we're going to call a point at infinity, usually denoted by the infinity symbol to the complex plane. And one way of, a convenient way of doing this is to use what is called stereographic projection. By the way, in the complex plane there is only one point at infinity. So we don't have a plus infinity and a minus infinity that are somehow different in the complex plane. There is only one point at infinity, as we will see when we look at this um, stereographic projection. So we take a, uh, a complex plane. So think of the complex plane down here. And what I'm going to do then is I'm going to add in an extra axis, which you can think of as a north pole. So here's the complex plane down below. I'm going to add in an extra axis. Uh, and I'm going to put a sphere there, center a half, 
uh, radius a half. So, in other words, um, we're, we're thinking of the complex plane now as the horizontal plane xy0, and s is going to be the sphere in R cubed of centre naught naught a half radius a half. The, the north pole here is the point naught naught one, and the south pole is naught naught naught. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a point in the complex plane down here. Here's my z. So it's in the complex plane with coordinates x, y, 0. And I'm going to connect that up with the north pole by a straight line. And I'm going to see where that intersects the sphere s. Now the point where it intersects the sphere, I'm going to call p. And that's going to be some function of the complex number, 5z. Now, you can see that any point in the complex plane, I can do this to, and it's going to correspond to some point on the sphere. So it's going to give me a one-to-one -one correspondence between any complex number, z in the complex number, and any point p on the sphere, except for the north pole. We can't, const we can't get to the North Pole using this construction. Now, here's, I'm going to just tell you now what the formula is for this 5z. Here it is. So we take uh, z as x plus iy. So 5z is x on 1 plus the modulus of z squared. The y coordinate is y on 1 plus modulus of z squared. And the z coordinate is 1 plus z squared on the denominator and mod z squared on the top. Let's just accept that formula for the moment. So just as a little example here, if we take the circle down here in the plane, if we take mod z is 1 in the complex plane, then we can see what it maps to. Using this formula, mod, if, I'm in, if mod z is 1, then this is just going to correspond here to if I put mod z is 1, then each of these denominators is going to be equal to 2. This will be 1, so I'll just get x on 2, y on 2, and 1 on 2. So that's phi of z. There are its coordinates, and let me call them capital X, capital Y, capital Z. And notice then that if I do capital X plus capital Y, then... I get little x squared on 4 plus little y squared on 4. But we're on mod z equals 1, so x plus y squared is 1. That just gives me a quarter. And z has the component a half. And so that is mapping onto the equator. So if I take the circle mod z is 1 down here in the xy plane and apply this func function phi to it, I land on the equator, which is rather cute. As a little example here, what is the image of phi of 1 over z, and um, where does it lie in relation to phi of z? Well, again, I'm going to do some computation here. So um, I need to talk about mod z, so we immediately think of zz bar is mod z squared. And so I can write 1 over z bar is z over mod z squared. And so if I want to work out phi of 1 over z bar, I work out phi of z over z bar squared. And when I plug this in, this is going to give me then x on, this is phi of x plus z, mod z squared plus i y on mod z squared. And then applying our formula here for phi, we get the x co coordinate over 1 plus mod z squared. Now mod z is going to be that squared plus this squared. So I'm going to get uh, 1 plus, sorry, well I can get this from here. This is z is going to be, um, uh, sorry, the modulus of this is going to simply be this. So I plug this in. Now we run that through and I tidy up this mess multiplying top and bottom by mod z squared. And I end up with this a formula here, which, by the way, looks not that dissimilar from our formula we started with, except for the last co component here. 
but I can rewrite that as 1 minus mod z squared on 1 plus mod z squared. In other words, this is just uh, exactly what I started with, except the z coordinates been replaced with 1 minus what we started with. Now that means then that phi of z and phi of 1 on z bar are simply reflections of each other in the equator because this is 1 minus this thing. So any point we start off, um, if we have got a point here of phi of z, then 1 minus this is going to get me up here and conversely. So this, these are going to be reflections of each other in the equator. Well, there are lots of nice little things one can do with this. Uh, I'll just list some things you can do to play with this, um, with this particular stereographic projection. Firstly, uh, challenge problem number two, to prove this formula for phi is in fact correct, just by doing some uh, simple Carte Cartesian geometry. Also, see if you can find a relationship between phi of z and phi of minus z. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to identify the north pole with what we're going to call the point at infinity in the what we're going to call the extended complex plane. The extended complex plane, written as c star, is the complex plane union this point at infinity. And that's going to correspond to an imaginary point in the complex plane that corresponds to the North Pole under the mapping we've just seen. So that means then this extended complex plane can be put into a one-to-one -one correspondence with the whole of the sphere S. And this sphere is known as the Riemann sphere. Now if you want to play with this a little bit more, uh, here's another challenge problem. To play with the the Riemann sphere is great fun to play with. Show that every circle in the complex plane gets mapped by this phi to some circle on S, which avoids the north pole. So every, take any circle in the complex plane, not necessarily centered the origin. Any circle will get mapped by phi into a circle on S that will avoid the north pole. And every line in the complex plane gets mapped by phi to a circle on the sphere which passes through the North Pole. That's very nice. Any line in the complex plane gets mapped by this phi to a circle on the sphere that passes through the North Pole. And these last two results show that lines and circles in the complex plane are analogous to each other. They have some interesting connection, and we'll see that when we start looking at some Mobius functions in the next video.